Thanks very much. I uh, greatly appreciate the, in, uh, the introduction, Alon, and again, uh, the privilege of being here today. Greatly appreciate it. So I want to talk a little bit about the new program we have in the U.S., uh, the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer. This program came about because of a lot of heterogeneity in care. We just heard our ACS president tell us about the uh, salami slicing, and indeed did put us at the right part of the pig for sure. Um, but the problem is there's, despite it, all of this salami slicing, there's still the majority of colorectal resections, and in particular rectal cancer resections, until recently still being done by general surgeons, which doesn't always have the best outcome for the patient. So this study has been out there for 20 years from Edmonton, Canada, comparing the outcomes of general surgeons and specialty colorectal trained surgeons, of whom there were only five out of their 52 surgeons, caring for patients with rectal cancer. And what they found is that the colorectal trained individuals tended to take care of tumors lower in the rectum than did the general surgeons. Despite the tumors being more distal, the patients were more apt to undergo a restorative resection rather than a permanent colostomy. Well, you might say that's great, but if you're cutting corners just to technically show your prowess at creating a coloanal anastomosis or an interesting section, that's not in the patient's best interest because they're going to die of a local recurrence. But in fact, what they found is rather the opposite. And, and if you follow the way this... Um, shows you've got the, the uh, local recurrence rate being best in people who are both colorectal trained and doing a higher volume, being worst in, patient, uh, in patients who underwent surgery by surgeons doing a low volume and not having been trained. I mean, this is a coin toss. This is telling the patient, well, we'll operate on you, got a 50-50 chance of local recurrence. I mean, just think about that. And then in between were patients operated on either by people doing lower volumes who had been trained, or this is more or less the same, <clears throat> not having been trained but doing a higher, a higher volume of cases. And the same was true for disease-specific survival, if you march it out on that graph. So when they looked at their uh, multivariate analysis, they found that indeed colorectal training had, a very, had the highest hazard ratio of everything they looked at for local recurrence um, and uh, uh, disease-specific survival. Same was true in the UK. We just saw some UK uh, trauma uh, information. This is some UK colorectal information wherein patients who underwent their rectal cancer surgery by non-specialty trained individuals were three and a half times more likely to have sustained a local recurrence. And, and these data were true throughout the world. And you see Australia uh, more than 20 years ago by Left Bouquet, that study I showed you. This one is the State of Maryland database. That one's a little bit different because they also look at hospital volumes as well as surgical volumes. Paul Hermanek in Erlangen, Germany. This study is a New York State database study, another UK study, one of our alumni from China, Hao Wang in, in Shanghai, uh, and so on. Some of these are huge studies, and they all show more or less the same thing that if the surgeons are doing higher volumes, the lower local recurrence. Now, in many of these countries, there are no fellowship training programs, such as in, in, in China, there hadn't been at this time. And even in Australia, back when Les Bouquet published that, there were no fellowship training. So the idea isn't necessarily having a piece of paper, but it's having learned how to do it and focusing your practice on it so that that is what you do day in and day out. And whether you're trained in surgical oncology in general surgery, in general surgery plus colorectal surgery, if you've done a minimally invasive fellowship from the fellowship council, that's not the idea. The idea is that it's something that you do on a daily basis, that you constantly audit your results, that you're doing your CMEs in it, and you're not dabbling in it. That's, that's the point of the exercise. Globally, however, in the U.S., <clears throat> despite having had colorectal residency programs, for decades, uh, the American Board of Colorectal Surgery was, was started right around the time of the American Board of Surgery. Uh, it's more than 60 years ago. But despite that, we look at our rates of colostomy, and they're the highest in the world. Um, whether on a national or a statewide level from California, we have the highest rates of, of colostomies. And when we look at what's important for predicting local recurrence, and we discussed it yesterday with uh, total mesorectal excision, having an intact specimen, and having a tumor-negative circumferential resection margin, again, 
We're at the bottom of the barrel in the U.S. with a 17% CRM positivity rate compared to France, uh, Germany, Netherlands, Poland, and, and the U.K. These data can be improved upon, and that's been shown. So, for example, in Sweden, this study showed that by focusing people's attention on rectal cancer and doing higher volumes in a multidisciplinary approach with constant auditing of data, decrease their local recurrence rates from that coin toss of almost 50% down to 13% with, not surprisingly, a commensurate increase in uh, tumor-specific survival. Ken Smed did a similar study in Sweden looking at uh, the survival rates, both five and 10 year overall survival, and found that they improved as people started getting their care in centers where rectal cancer was a focus of attention and not an occasional uh, pastime. Same in, in Denmark, improvements in five-year relative survival and five-year overall survival. And throughout Europe, there's been many different countries that have shown different things, like as, as you develop what they call centers of excellence, it is not a term we're using in, in the US, but it calls centers of excellence in Europe, better adherence to total mesorectal excision with production of a complete or near complete rather than an incomplete specimen, lower rates of stoma creation, lower local recurrence rate, and improved overall survival in numerous countries. In the U.S., it was rec it's been recognized for many years that there's a problem, but it, it wasn't really codified as to what we can do about this problem. Now, right around this time of 2007, perhaps a little bit earlier, David Rothenberger from University of Minnesota put together an initiative to try to have some kind of a national program, but unfortunately it didn't take off at that time. So we put a group together in April of 2011 that, that met in Cleveland, uh, Ohio, uh, including people who were active in many societies, Society for Surgical Oncology, Society for Surgery of the Alimentary Tract, American Society of Colonial Surgeons, um, and uh, SAGES, as well as College of American Pathology and American College of Radiology in a multidisciplinary setting, including people from private practice, from university practice, from large clinics, small clinics, to try to look at the literature and figure out what we could do about it. So this is one of the things we came across, and Rocco Riccardi at this time was a fellow in the, at the University of Minnesota, uh, where I had trained once upon a time. And you can see that the data, not all too long ago, was that 60% of patients walked out of the hospital with a colostomy for rectal cancer. Um, and in fact, you know, is, is that appropriate, that, that people have colostomies? You, you know, you just divide the rectum in thirds, even if there's the same percentage of tumors in each of the thirds, which there isn't, you, you know, you should have just the distal third, which should be 30 percent, just simple math, and yet it's 60 percent, so you've got to wonder what's going on there. So when Rocco finished training and moved on to the Leahy Clinic, he started looking in, at this in more detail, and, and he did this, like, heat map. So looking at a variety of states in the U.S. and then county-level data found that there are high stoma and low stoma counties. Unfortunately, not a whole lot of low stoma counties. Only 20 percent of counties in the U.S. had colostomy rates similar to Europe. And conversely, if you look at counties uh, where rates are 61 percent or higher, you get around 25 percent of, of counties. Now, is it possible that patients in those 25 percent of U.S. counties only have tumors that invade their anal sphincters that don't respond to new adjuvant therapy? Highly unlikely. Probably other factors at play, such as how the surgery is being done and in what setting the surgery is being done. And indeed, that started to play out as he, he moved forward with one more paper and found that 40% of surgeons in the U.S. did only APRs. And those people also were giving their patients higher mortality rates, and perhaps for the same reasons we just heard as failure to rescue. You're not doing a lot of these. You don't recognize the complications early on, such as anastomotic leak, and patients die rather than having been rescued. But be that as it may, Patients who were undergoing restorative resections were doing so at the hands of surgeons who were doing more pelvic surgery, more interrectal. In other words, people with a focus, not necessarily board certified by the American Board of Colorectal Surgery, but people who were doing this as a focus of their practice. And again, do you think that 40 percent of surgeons only see patients who have tumors invading the anal sphincters? I don't think so. So there's another problem at play here. 
And there are other things that, that Rocco found, such as these high stoma counties tended not to have MR or PET scanners, tended not to have teaching hospitals, tended not to have specialized uh, care. So this group that we put together, which was the consortium, and I didn't think of the name, Dave Dietz did, but Consortium for Optimizing Surgical Treatment of Rectal Cancer, it does have a role, though, because we, until this time, were putting our heads in the sand about rectal cancer and pretending there wasn't a problem, like the ostrich just ducking its head and hoping that uh, things would pass around it. So this group of six societies had representatives, and ultimately, we then said, we're going to try to improve quality and uniformity of rectal care, but we need partners. And the partners are, of course, the American College of Surgeons and the Commission on Cancer. Um, during the years from 2011 to 2014, we put together a variety of call to action papers. This one we had presented at the American Surgical uh, Disease of the Colon Rectum, Colorectal Disease. This one was in, in, in JAMA. Uh, again, uh, this one was at American uh, Surgical and, and Annals of Surgery. This one was in, in JAX and so on. The reason why our working group turned to the college is what you heard yesterday, the quality programs of the college. There's no other organization in the world that has the capability to manage this type of program for a population of, a, of more than a third of a billion people and manage it well. And since the college started in 1913, quality has been the essence of the existence of the college with these programs listed, including, and, and I know there's a directive here in Israel that every hospital is supposed to be JCI uh, accredited by some date, don't know what the date is, and, and actually JCI was JACO, and that was started by the college. That's no longer a college uh, program, but all the others are, and the Commission on Cancer has been around for almost 100 years. So it's the right place for us to have gone with our, our project and our request. What is the COC? It's not strictly surgeons. It's not even strictly physicians. There's many, many groups that participate. There's administrative groups here, such as uh, cancer coders, the people who put the codes down for these things for us, advocacy groups like the Livestrong Foundation, allied health organizations, for example, pediatric oncology social workers. Sure, lots of clinical groups, including, of course, the ASCRS, SAGES, SSAT, College of American Pathologists, American College of Radiology, all the people we had involved, the Young Fellows Associations. There are many clinical groups, but there are a lot of non-clinical groups here, too, and that's important. There are government representatives in, in the COC. There are registry groups, and there are research groups. So the, the COC is very robust and truly represents all aspects of cancer care uh, in the United States. The COC participates jointly with the American Cancer Society and the National Cancer Database, which is the world's largest repository, something over 10 million cases with 250 data points per, per patient. And the way the COC works is standards are established. And by following those standards, patient outcomes should be improved. Here's an example from the National Accreditation Program for uh, Breast Centers. This is a bit different because NAPRC, the rectal cancer program, requires as a prerequisite COC accreditation. NABPC does not. The program can have NABPC accreditation and or COC accreditation. So what this particular study did was look to see how often this particular standard was followed, that patients who had four or more positive nodes in mastectomy received post-mastectomy uh, uh, therapy. And what they found was at all points, hospitals which were NABPC specialty accredited did better than did COC hospitals. At every time point, it began when they started preparing for the accreditation visit by NABPC, and it kept going throughout the time period, and it kept getting better, and the COC programs never matched the NABPC because they specialized in it. So looking at what we found with rectal cancer, that, uh, that there was also tremendous variation in adherence to appropriate standards, with highest adherence being in high-volume centers, perhaps not surprisingly. And there was tremendous variety also, as we discussed, the CRM positivity rate of, of 17%. So we came up with standards. It took the COC Accreditation Committee, the COC Executive Committee, uh, in, April, in May of 2014, and then the ACS Board of Regents and Officers in 
uh, June of 2014, approved moving forward with creating a program. And between 2014 and 2017, <clears throat> this standards manual was created. The standards come in two flavors, program management and clinical services. Program management is basically process standards. Who do you need in place? How often do you meet? What forms do you need to fill out? Performance standards are how did you do? Did you do a proper TME? Did you take specimen photographs? And then quality improvement are things that may in the future become standards. So for example, every patient has to go <coughs> undergo definitive staging prior to treatment, including chest, abdomen, pelvis, CT, and an MRI using a synoptic protocol looking at the things that we care about. The synoptic protocol was originally created by Gina Brown from the Imperial in London, uh, Royal Marsden Hospital, and then changed slightly by the folks at the uh, University of Toronto and, and adopted by us. And we're also trying to use a synoptic report for surgeons. We're beta testing it because we know when we use synoptic reports, we capture more data. You can see, for example, in this study, double the amount of information when a synoptic report was used, 99% versus a narrative report with 46%. Um, independent checklists, synoptic reports, all give better information uh, than do free text. And Arden Morris at Stanford, working with the AFCRS, created for us a report which we've uh, beta tested at, at 10 different sites, over 100 reports, and she's now collating all the data for submission for publication. But it, it, it's basically a pop-up in the EMR, electronic medical record, that lets us uh, it, that ensures that we put in all the appropriate fields. In addition, the pathology report, when, when Dr. Barajo or, or, or the other pathologists look at the specimens, they have to fill out synoptic reports. In pathology, we know synoptic reports also improve outcomes of reporting. For example, intact mesorectum, free text 76%, synoptic reports 100%, CRM 76% to 100%. Similarly, and specimen photography, critical. There is no driver for the surgeon performing the operation that knowing that they're going to be sitting in a room, perhaps not quite this big, with maybe not quite as many people, but in their MDT with all of their medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pathologists, imagers, surgeons, med students, residents, fellows, looking at how surgeons performed, how we did with taking out the mesorectum, both the gross specimen and the bread loaf specimen. And it's an education for the imagers and the pathologists, too. This is an example of invasion of the seminal vesicle and uh, prostate at this arrow by, by the tumor. And we did a transanal TME with on block prostatectomy. And then we have uh, the, the Dr. Burrow produces the bread loaf specimen. And we see the correlation. And if there's not a perfect correlation, that's a learning experience for the imager and the pathologist, not just for us. Here's an example of extramural vascular invasion on imaging, perfect correlation on pathology. So it, it's a continuous quality improvement program. So we discuss the staging, and then we discuss at the second go round what we did to the patient and what that outcome is. Do they now need adjuvant therapy, although more and more patients are getting total neoadjuvant therapy up front. Does it matter? Well, this is an interesting study uh, from Cleveland Clinic main campus. And did I miss one? Well, this is from Cleveland Clinic main campus. And basically what they did is they, they looked at 371 patients, and they found that the management plan changed in roughly a quarter. More, so the surgeon goes into the conference saying, I think I'm doing X for this patient, direct surgery, no new adjuvant, for example. And at the end of the conference, it turns out, say, no, we're actually going to give new adjuvant first, or rather than a, a low anterior, I'm going to do a transanal excision. But what was fascinating is that the changes were just as likely whether the surgeons were relatively new in their career, mid-career, or, or latter career. These changes were equal. So the wisdom of the crowd applies whether you're just at a fellowship or you're in the latter parts of your career. You can always learn. You can always benefit from that group discussion. So the days of the surgeon saying to the patient, this is what you're getting when you meet the patient, are gone in the US for rectal cancer in NAPRC centers. It's now, I think this is what we're going to do. But on Monday from noon to 1, we're going to discuss your case with all of these people. And after that, we'll give you a call and confirm or tell you differently based upon the discussion of the group. Um, 
how are we doing in the U.S.? Are we ready for this program? Well, this is a, a survey that, that Lawrence Lee did when he was a fellow in Orlando. 41% um, response rate from, from a variety of institutions across the country. And using our standards, our COC and APRC standards, the mean compliance with the 20 standards was 10.6. Only, uh, only four centers at 100% compliance, all of which were higher volume centers. So again, when you're doing this a lot, you tend to be more compliant with the standards. So that's what people said they're doing. Now, using the NCDB, we also looked at what people actually are doing rather than what they said they're doing. And, and here are the different issues we looked at here. This was in JAX, the basic NCCN, number of nodes, uh, margins, and the like. And to cut to the chase here, in the interest of time, pretty similar to the 26%. 28% of, of programs uh, were, doing, were fulfilling all pro, or in 28% of cases, all the process measures were fulfilled out of about 36,000 patients. But you look here, for example, CEA was obtained in only 65%. Our standard calls for 75%. Treatment started within 60 days. We call for 80%. Actually, that was better. Tumor regression grade being reported. CRM, critically important, 95% standard, 88%, and so on for process measures. And when we then looked at performance measures, um, the negative CRM was 82%, which is pretty similar to the 83% uh, that we had in the Rickles article a few years earlier. So no real improvement. We hadn't moved the needle yet in, in our improvements in CRM negativity in our patients in, in the U.S. All performance measures, just over half. So there's definitely room for improvement at the beginning of, of, of this program. You can see all margins negative, only 80% of patients. So we have room for, for improvement. And you can see how bad it continues to be in some programs. This publication last month is retrospective, a, a chain of nine hospitals in the mountain states. Um, patients weren't even locally staged in 18%. In other words, they were treated without knowledge of, whether, of what their stage was on a local level. And new, appropriate new adjuvant therapy, according to standards and guidelines by the NCCN and, and COC, are omitted in 17%. So basically, one out of six patients isn't even getting staged or appropriately treated in, in this day and age. What were the risk factors for patients not being staged? Low volume, again, surgeons doing three or less cases per year. I mean, think about it. You're going to, well, most of you are going to drive home, but. Some of us are going to fly home, and I don't think those of us flying want to get on a plane, and the pilot says, don't worry, I, I fly at least two or three times a year. Um, but you want somebody doing your rectal cancer who flies two or, five, two or three times a year? I don't think so, at least not in the U.S., where, where there's so many choices. Um, surgeon local staging, strongly correlated with, with appropriate therapy, with volume, and like we've seen everywhere else, Lower volume surgeons had higher local recurrence rates for their patients. So the program is now live thanks to the American College of Surgeons and thanks to the Commission on Cancer. There are representatives of 40% uh, of the representatives of our, of our committees for the uh, NAPRC are from the fellowship of the college plus the Young Fellows Association plus the RAS, uh, Resident Affiliate Society, and the constituent societies make up our, our, uh, our, our program. Uh, we're having our first meetings of all of our committees in July in Washington, D.C., during our annual Quality and, and Safety Conference. So thanks to the college and the COC, we are very confident that rectal cancer outcomes in the United States are going to improve as they have in Europe. Thank you.